Good morning. So I'm here and I'm not in the Philippines, which is actually surprising. Uh, I, I, I will tell you that my passion uh, is actually disaster medicine. So how on earth did I get into pharmacogenomics? I am, uh, I've been at Boston Children's for 17 years. I was trained as a pharmacist. I'm also a registered, nationally registered emergency medical technician. And I pretty much practice emergency medicine most of the time until about two years ago. And two years ago, this guy called David Margulies, who uh, was at Children's for a long time and had gone away to do some really cool genetic stuff in the real world of commercial medicine, and then came back and said, you know what, we really need to revive our personalized medicine here at Boston Children's because we are not doing what the rest of the country is doing. And one of those pieces of personalized medicine is pharmacogenomics. I said, well, stop. That is not what I trained in. He said, do you know pharmacology? And I said, well, yeah. He said, do you know Cerner? Because that's our, our medical record. And I said, yeah. He goes, then you're the perfect person for the job. I said, I don't know about that. So over the course of the last two years, we've actually developed a um, relatively robust, I, I like to say, uh, clinical service at Boston Children's for using pharmacogenomics at the bedside, as well as a research mission. So I'm gonna to talk to you today a little bit about what we're doing and what you're gonna see come to you in the next five years. I can promise you, you are going to be using pharmacogenomics in your practice in the next five years. So what is it? So pharmacogenomics or pharmacogenetics, they're relatively interchangeable. These terms, sometimes if you talk to a lab guy, they'll tell you, okay, pharmacogenetics is the result, the result for this patient, whereas pharmacogenomics is the grand scheme of things. How do you apply all of these pharmacogenetic results to the patient in a pathway manner? So the other piece of this is what are we doing with it? What, are, what is pharmacogenomics? It's the study of gene expression. And it's the study of gene expression in those genes that control both the pharmacokinetics and the pharmacodynamics of the drug. So how the body acts on the drug and how the drug acts in the body. And we know you guys have all had a patient who you use the dose in the book, whatever book it is, please tell me it's not the Harriet Lane. Uh, I just will pretend you don't use that. Uh, but any other book, and you tell me you used that dose on this patient, and it should have worked for this patient, and it didn't work at all. Or, opposite, they had a horrible reaction that had nothing to do with the dose that you gave. And why is that? Well, part of that, a piece of that may be their genetics. So what is our goal with using pharmacogenomics? There has to be a return on investment, right? We're not going to put all this money into a program that may or may not benefit more than one patient, right? So we have to make sure that what we're doing is going to make a difference. It does. So if you look at what the goal is for pharmacogenomics as a whole, it is to decrease adverse drug reactions. That is the major goal. So we know that the morbidity and mortality from adverse drug reactions in this country and around the world is sky high. These numbers actually came from the first IOM report uh, way back in the day to Ayers Human. We all remember that one, right? And they just came out probably about two or three weeks ago and said, you know what? We underestimated that. Multiply these by two at least. So back in the day when that came out, at least two million visits per year in the United States were due to adverse drug reactions. 100,000 deaths. I will tell you it's more than that. 6% of hospital admissions, and over $850 million per year we spend on treating the reactions because we gave someone a drug. We also use pharmacogenomics in the big pharma world for companion testing. What does this mean? So there are some drugs, particularly in adults now, you cannot prescribe if you do not get a genetics test first. So breast cancer. There are drugs to treat breast cancer. And if you do not have a certain gene, you cannot use it. And that's part of the labeling. So that's a companion test because that drug has been designed for patients who have that gene expression. We also are looking at salvaging drugs with high toxicity profiles. So you all remember there have been drugs who we thought were great, at least in some patients, who got yanked off the market, right? Cisapride. One of the, one of the, uh, Floxacin, I'm trying to remember which one it was. Come on, Tom, you can help me here. Gaddy, Gaddy Floxacin, pulled off the market. Good drug in some patients, but very toxic, and in fact, unfortunately called liver, liver failure in other patients. Who was that? Who, who actually was going to get liver failure from Gaddy Floxacin? And who wouldn't? Who can we use it in? The other really cool thing that is just coming out is there is a benefit to performing pharmacogenomic testing on individuals, even if they come back as normal. And I'll tell you a funny story about being normal. 
they actually adhere to their drug regimen better just because they were tested and because they know they were tested. And that is, that is a really interesting phenomenon that we hadn't seen or hadn't studied before. We didn't even know that was happening. And there's some really interesting data that's coming out now showing that if you do pharmacogenomics testing and you tell the patient, we looked at your genes and these drugs are okay for you and these drugs you need to avoid and these drugs we're gonna actually reduce the dose. They then take that information and it's part of their identity. And they say, well, I know that what you're prescribing me now, I'm, I'm more confident that I should be taking this. And believe it or not, it's true, and they really do adhere better. So just as a quick review, genes obviously can be polymorphic, meaning that they have many forms. And that's also within the ind individual between the same genes. You can have multiple copies of certain genes. Uh, CYP2D6, which is one of my favorites and least favorite uh, of all, we'll talk about in a little while. You can have multiple copies. I could have two, you can have 18. And so we have to type all of those copies in order to make sure that we have the right call. These differences are represented by variants or alleles, so you'll, you'll hear me talk a little bit about variants more often. Uh, and when we look at pharmacogenomics, if you get a result back from a lab, it will be interpreted as star one, star one, or star one, star three. Those are called star alleles. Honestly, it was sort of a naming convention that they came up with in the 1960s and it stuck, but it really isn't used for any other genetic tests, so it's kind of unique to pharmacogenomics. Now, if the alleles are the same, as you know, the individual is homozygous. If, the, if they are different, the individual is considered to be heterozygous. So, here's your first quiz question. Did you, you didn't know you were going to be tested, did you? Patient's laboratory report indicates they are heterozygous for the TPMT gene. TPMT is thiopurine methyltransferase. It actually controls the metabolism of the thiopurine drugs. The major one we, know, we use all the time in pediatrics is 6 mecaptopurine, both in IBD and ALL. So, which of the following be the correct call if the patient is heterozygous? Is it wild type, star 1, star 1, which IE is normal? Star 3A, star 3C? Star 1, star 2? Oh, shoot! <laughs> I thought there were four choices. What's the answer? <laughs> Number three, right? Because they're heterozygous. They have two different calls. Now, one might argue number two could be correct, right? But they're not. They're both star 3 alleles. They're just, they have a subcategorization underneath it, so they're homozygous. All right, so mutations, they can be single base substitutions or they can be what we call indels. So those are either insertions or deletions. They can be synonymous, meaning they're next to each other in the same uh, enzyme coding region, or they can be non-synonymous and meaning that they're in different regions. And you can have frame shifts. All of this is more technical, but you will see that on, sometimes on some of the reports. So I just wanted to cover it really quickly. And then of course, we are not talking about the, the mutations that are induced, right? So we're talking about mutations that you actually are born with. This is part of your, your genetic makeup. But there of course are environmental insults that we have that can cause mutations such as UV light. And th that's separate. That's often covered in cancer genomics where you do tumor testing as well as somatic testing so that you can tell the difference. <laughs> So let's talk a little bit about phenotype and genotype. So phenotype refers to the expression of your genes. So as you can see here, we have two different phenotypes. We have one person with an attached earlobe and one person with an unattached earlobe. So how many of us are attached? Okay, you have phenotype number one. How many of us are unattached? We have phenotype number two. So you can see that phenotype number two is actually more prevalent, right? And that's often, that's often the case. Can be visible, like the earlobes, skin color, height, eye color and can be invisible, like your blood type. The healthcare team will need to provide phenotypes, so when you start to order these tests, and I'm not saying you're gonna do it today or tomorrow, but as this becomes part of what you do, you're gonna be asked for a phenotype. And usually this is a questionnaire about the patient. How tall are they? How much do they weigh? What is their manifestation of their disease that you're interested in, and why are we getting this test done? Um, <coughs> electronic medical records are good, sometimes. Sometimes this data is more free text and found in notes, which is very hard to cull out. So you will often be asked when you submit a genetics test, including some pharmacogenomic testing for, for difficult patients, patients who you know them, they've had 30 reactions to 20 drugs, so they're, they're convinced they can't take anything. Those patients, I'm going to ask for a little bit of a more detailed history. I promise it's only two pages. Um, so the basics of pharmacogenomics here, we're looking primarily at drug metabolizing enzymes. So these are the CYP enzymes, the ones in the liver that pretty much do most of the hard heavy lifting. We look at drug transports. So uh, SLCO1B1 is actually responsible for statins. 
And that's a big deal in the adult population and becoming a bigger deal as of yesterday and the publication of, I think, a third of us in this room. So all you guys are on statins. <laughs> Starting tomorrow. Um, and then drug targets. So VCOR C1, that's one of my favorites. That's one of the warfarin drug targets, vitamin K. Very important in deciding what dose of warfarin to start a patient on. This is big in the adult world, and it's starting to become very important in the pediatric world as well. And then we also look at downstream effects of metabolites. Where do they land? What, what uh, receptors do they fall on? So what I would say to you is think of pharmacogenomics as one more piece of information. It is not going to tell you everything. It is not 100% yes, I know that this drug is the right thing for this patient because it's just... It depends on the penetrant. It depends on how much of an influence that that gene has on that drug metabolism. So if you also have a high serum creatinine and you smoke, what percentage of it is your genes for, that, for the metabolism of that particular drug? Maybe 30%, maybe 50%. Some of them are really high, like the thiopurines. TPMT is very important in about 75% of the patients. But things like warfarin, we know the VCOR C1 is only imp important in 25% of your variable response to warfarin. The rest is, what did you eat for lunch? Did you have a spinach salad? You kind of screwed up my dosing. Because that, that's more important in patients. So it, the, the range of, of how you use the pharmacogenomic information is actually great. And that's part of the science. It's part of the fun of figuring out how much, how much is the gene information important. And when we start to build these clinical decision support rules in your electronic medical record, and it fires when, the gene, when this patient has a variant that's important for this gene, it also will tell you the other things that are important for that gene, if they build it right. They sh it, it should tell you the other things that are important. So we classify patients like we talked about. You are normal if you're a wild type. I had a patient, one of, my, one of my first patients was actually an adult that I saw in clinic. And I had, they were referred to me from Tufts because Tufts doesn't have a clinical pharmacogenomic service. And so I, I get the request to see adults from Tufts. And I go to Gary Fleisch and I say, Gary, can I see patients that are over the age of 18? And he said, yes, you may. And I said, oh, OK. <laughs> I guess I'll see them. So I, uh, I saw this patient, lovely, sat down, had a nice conversation. Um, she had a history of schizophrenia that she chose to argue with. And so she came to me seeking pharmacogenomic results, because she had a laundry list of I've had bad reactions to all these medications and everything. But her real goal, when you got down to it, was she wanted to tell her family that she had a get out of jail free card so she didn't have to take her antipsychotics anymore. I said, OK, we're going to be right clear up front that this is not going to be a get out of jail free card. This will hopefully help us explain some of the reactions you've had in the past. But I, I can't guarantee you what we're going to find. And lo and behold, it comes back, and she's absolutely normal relatively. And she was very upset with the fact that I had to tell her that her genetics, from what we could see, and how much that plays into each different drug, really was dependent on when we sat down and we talked about the drugs. It was, you know, 10% of this drug, 50% of this drug's metabolism. It's not the whole picture. And had to reinforce the fact that she probably did have reactions, but that her genetics weren't necessarily the cause of that. So. Again, it's one more piece of information, um, and it's not the end all be all, but it is important. So this is not new. This is actually an excerpt from the rounds out in LA in 1969, and they've talked about pharmacogenomics on morning, morning rounds. Why did it take so long? Oh, first I have another quiz question. First you have to tell me three drug gene pairs that are in clinical use in the United States today, and you can't use the breast cancer one. So what do we use? We've talked about a couple of them. Warfarin, right? So CYP2C9, VCOR C1, and warfarin. Yep. Lung cancer, there is, absolutely. I can't tell you off the top of my head which one that is, because I don't see a whole heck of a lot of lung cancer in my line of work. But uh, absolutely. We talked about TPMT. And ovarian cancer, absolutely. So the major ones right now that are in clinical use in both adult hospitals and in pediatrics are the TPMT and thiopurines because it's easy. I'll tell you a little bit more about that one as we go forward. 2D6 and codeine. That one is not easy. Uh, there's a lot of problems with that. 2C9, 2C9 VCOR C1, and warfarin. And then 2C19 and Plavix, one of our favorites uh, in the adult world, right? And then, of course, the cancer ones for, for the adults. So. Why, is, why are we not doing more pharmacogenomics? We talked that they were talking about it in the 1960s, right? Because it costs a lot of money. 
It cost a lot of money to do it originally. And sequencing at the time, when, we, when they first did the, the whole genome, anybody remember how much that cost? Over $1 billion to do the whole genome. We can now do it for $5,000. I will tell you that in five years, the goal is to get that cost for an entire genome under $1,000 so that everybody will have either an exome or a genome done, maybe at birth. So you're preemptively going forward with this information, and I'm interested in the pharmacogenomics part, but everybody else I work with is interested in all the other stuff, uh, and, and this will be part of your medical identity going forward. Problem is, a whole genome is a terabyte worth of data. Where the heck am I going to put that? Because I'll tell you it'll crash our medical record system right now. We can't put a terabyte worth of data in there. So we have to talk about cloud storage, and with cloud storage comes privacy concerns. Uh, it is getting better, and we're going to have to use it as we go forward, and that's something that, that we all struggle with right now. So it requires space, it requires time, it requires money. Uh, and a lot of times what you saw was that pharmacogenomics programs were really started in the university hospitals and the teaching centers and the cancer centers. The FDA currently has 107 drugs that have PGX markers in their, in their drug labels, and 44 in the European equivalent. How does it get in the drug label? It has to, one, either increase the adverse effects by having this variant, or it actually has to reduce drug efficacy. And so there's a whole group called CIPIC who puts together these uh, guidelines on how to use these variants. They have a great website called farmgkb.org. So if you ever get a report back, one of the places you can go to look up the information about that is on that website. And this is it, farmgkb.org. And this is what the guidelines look like. You just click on it. So if you're interested in TPMT and thiopurines, or if you've got a patient on Plavix, you just click on that. It has the reference, but it also tells you what to do, which is pretty cool. Not tons on peds. The thiopurines, actually, uh, that was done by St. Jude's, which was great because that is pediatric-centric. The rest of them were working on pediatric guidelines. So how do we decide what goes into our electronic medical record? What are we forward-facing to the physicians today at Boston Children's? Well, that's decided by the Oversight Committee, and Chuck is a member who just left me. Um, but uh, it's a whole group of people who are very interested in the use of pharmacogenomics in medicine, as well as bench scientists, uh, clinical genetic counselors, pharmacists, everybody that's very interested in pharmacogenomics. And so what makes a good pharmacogenomics candidate? Well, it has to have a narrow therapeutic index. Amoxicillin, I can give you 20 per kilo or 200 per kilo, and pretty much the same thing happens. You might get a little more diarrhea with the 200 per kilo. But in the end, it's got a huge therapeutic range. So it's not a great PGX candidate because there's such a wide, as Alan would say, there's such a wide therapeutic index that toxicity is unlikely with that in normal doses. However, if we talk about things like thiopurines or digoxin or something that's got a very small therapeutic index, your genetic influence on that can make a humongous difference. Is it one gene? Is it one gene that's going to help me tell the right dose for this patient or if I should avoid it altogether? Or is it a whole bunch of genes that work together? That makes it a little more complicated. Are there assays available? And of course, it comes down to are they reimbursable too, right? So we want to make sure that we try to get some system back to make it sustainable. We have this whole checklist that we go through in the committee to decide whether or not we should go forward with it in the medical record, and uh, then we give it a score. And I want to touch a little bit on the ethics of pharmacogenomics, because as we got into this whole mess about a year or a year and a half ago, the ACMG, which is the American Academy of Mil Medical Genetics and Genomics, met, and they decided that there were about two dozen very important genes that they thought, if you run an exome, you have to return, even if that's not what you're looking for. Okay, so you're going to tell me that I have to tell this two-year-old now that they have a BRCA mutation and they may get breast cancer? They may not. Is that appropriate? And so the pediatric community is rather up in arms about this mantra saying, if you do genetic testing that is sequencing, not just a single gene, but if you do a panel, like an exome or, or, or a genome, then you have to return these. And they may be adult onset, and that's really small, but there's a lot of adult onset information in there. So the American Academy of Pediatrics said, mm, hold on. Let's think about this. We have to make sure that we're doing it in the best interest of the child. Because one of the arguments from the ACMG is, well, even if it's not going to benefit that child directly, maybe it'll benefit some of the family members. Have we practiced medicine like that before? 
Not really, right? And so we have to really think about the age of autonomy and when they can decide that they want these results. If you have a disease like Huntington's, for which there is no cure, and there's no active, let's say there was no active studies to be enrolled in at the time, is that something you want to tell them up front? So is that part of their identity that I'm going to die in my early 20s? Or do you let them live a normal life? And I can't tell you the right answer. This is being debated by ethicists all around the country. But this is a reality. So this is something that we also have to grapple with at Children's. Are we reporting back these 24 very important genes if we do an exome sequence, or are we not? Uh, we have not made that decision yet. So are they, how are these examples different? You've got a two-year-old with a BRCA mutation. You've got a 14-year-old with an increased risk of Alzheimer's a 10-year-old with an HTT mutation, a six-month-old with a CYP2D6 gain-of-function variant. So this comes down to what is important right now. So most of these things, those top three, are adult onset. They're later. So and HTT is the Huntington's. The six-month-old with 2D6 gain-of-function, that's actually important for a lot of their drugs, and it's important to them, to the six-month-old. And it comes down to also patient preference. So, according to the current AAP recommendations, should a three-year-old child have their carrier status for the CFTR, cystic fibrosis gene returned? Probably not, right? Because the carrier status is not going to directly affect that child until they become of childbearing age. So, age of ascent. When are they worth it? When do we know when pharmacogenomics is worth it? What is the number needed to treat? So if I know that the incidence of Stevens-Johnson's with carbamazepine in the Japanese population is 20%, but in the Caucasian population in the Northeast United States it's 0.1%, do I test everybody in the Northeast United States for that mutation before I put them on Tegretol? Not necessarily, right? So we have to think about how, how this works with our population. There's a bunch of different assays. Right now, we're really focusing on panels. So we sort of get away from that sticky quagmire of all those other genes because I'm not sequencing. I'm not doing exome. I'm not doing genome sequencing. I'm just looking at these specific genes. And therefore, I don't have to return all of these little interesting VIP genes. Someday, exome testing is going to be cheaper than me running these panels. These panels right now cost anywhere between $200 and $500. Exome testing right now is somewhere in the lines of $1,200 to $1,800. It won't be. Very soon it's going to be cheaper. And so how do we get, how do we handle all of these issues as we go forward? So some of the clinically actionable we've talked about, warfarin, there's actually a great uh, algorithm for adults, if you're over 18, on warfarindosing.org. And you put in your genotype, and you put in the patient's weight, and it tells you what dose to start them on. And this has been validated over and over that it's superior to us guessing at the first dose. Codeine, well, codeine at Boston Children's Hospital is a bad word. Um, we actually do not use it. It has been taken off the formulary. Not only has it been taken off the formulary, you can't even order it as a prescription. Um, I didn't do that. Uh, so the, the big deal, and I don't know if Christine touched on this or not, but uh, there is obviously an increased risk of apnea and mortality and morbidity secondary to patients who got codeine post-TNA and uh, the pediatric patients. And so there was a knee-jerk reaction by a lot of the children's hospitals around the country to say, no more codeine, because it was easier than saying, we're going to test everyone for 2D6, right? Because they don't have it up and running. And the other problem with 2D6 is because of the copy numbers. And no one is 100% convinced we have it right yet. As soon as we have this assay right, I think you're going to see that a lot of uh, push will be to make sure that we have 2D6 typing on everybody. And then carbamazepine, we talked about a little bit. Again, 15 to 20% of Asians. Uh, it's actually not on the market. In Japan and China, you cannot get Tegretol. They took it off the market because of the high incidence of SJS. Of course, it's here in the United States because we don't have that. And then this is the patient warning uh, right out of the package insert. So what are we doing at Children's? Um, like I talked about, the Oversight Committee was formed. Uh, as of August 1st, 2012, we did soup to nuts. We actually have a consult form. We have formal consults. We have curbside consults. I see patients in clinic uh, and every clinic. So I go to genetics, neurology, adolescent, um, trying to think of the other clinic, metabolism clinic. Bunch of different clinics, and it, so basically, it's wherever they have patients. Oh, CCS, of course, and they want me to to do a consult. I'll go out to that clinic. Uh, as of the end of September, we had run 225 TPMT samples in house. We actually are now up to 250, and all of these results are returned to the EMR. And there is clinical decision support at the end for both the physician and the pharmacist when they go to process those orders. It will only fire if they're not normal. I don't like using that word, but 
That's, that's how we have to talk about it. This is what it looks like in the medical record. So you can see those star alleles are right on there. And then this is the warning you get. Your patient has a genetic deficiency of this enzyme. Are you sure you want to continue? If you're not sure, call me. Uh, so basically, that's what they look like. The pharmacist gets the alert. And we did a survey at the end of last year, and hopefully some of my colleagues in the room filled it out. Um, but basically asking all prescribers, hey, what do you know about pharmacogenomics? Look at this, 84% said, I haven't ordered anything in the last six months. I am not sure. And we asked, oh, I'm sorry, that was, what do you know? How much training have you had? 84%. And 91% said, I haven't ordered anything in the last six months. So we knew we had an uphill battle with education, and that's what we're doing. Um, so what's next? We're going to add more drug gene pairs. We continue to improve the IT platform because one terabyte times, oh, I don't know, 100,000 patients pretty much just sync us. So we have to figure out how to handle all of this data and what we do about all these policies. And then in the end, we're going to start warning people, hey, if you want to prescribe this drug, you might want to think about PGX testing ahead of time um, because that's probably a good idea for this patient. Your homework, go up, go look this up. And then if you have a chance, read The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. Fantastic read. Thank you. <laughs>